All right, today I am here to talk about empowering continuous delivery with Spinnaker. Um, this is essentially a state of the union for Spinnaker. Um, up here today, I'm Cameron Modavaslani. I work at Harness as a principal engineer, and I'm also chair of the Spinnaker TOC. And I'm David Byron, also on the Spinnaker TOC, and I work at Salesforce. We are having a little bit of uh, video issues. Apologies for this, but we'll try to keep it um, Try to keep it going, I guess. All right, so what, what is Spinnaker? I realize I um, need to actually uh, mirror my display so I can see my speaker notes. Apologies. <laughs> cool. Right on. Thanks very much. Um, and so what is Spinnaker? So the main um, user experience of Spinnaker, developers come in and they'll create pipelines to run. Pipelines are comprised of stages, which are comprised of tasks. We hide this task view from the developers. Um, so what's so cool about Spinnaker? Well, it codifies best practices into these stages. Developers don't have to know about stuff like Highlander or a, how to write a blue-green deployment. They can just choose what their deployment strategy is when they're writing or updating the stage. Um, devs don't have to keep up with best practices for deploying to services. Um, or API changes. So if Amazon releases a new um, updated API, devs don't have to worry about it. Spinnaker will handle that for you. So let's talk a little bit of the, about the status of the project. Um, we're going to be going over a few different um, projects. A lot of these projects are in flight. So they are either done or partially done, and we will see the results of these um, uh, coming up. So we're going to go through these different projects in a uh, certain format. So this first one is the, more of a strategic initiative. And then the rest of them, I'm going to have some like uh, challenge and solution um, statements, essentially, for each of these um, projects to show the intent and what we're doing with the Spinnaker project. So this is our strategic initiative. One of our, our main strategic initiatives this, this year is CD event in integration. So we consume CD events to trigger pipelines. But we also create CD events um, as, as part of a notification strategy. So for any action you do within Spinnaker, you can create a CD event to alert any other um, service that you have that this event happened. We do this to help meet users where they're at. So you can use pick and choose your best in class tooling and have a nice loose coupling based on cloud events. Cloud events themselves are based on a, oh, sorry, CD events. CD events, that spec is based on a, a spec called cloud events, which comes out of CNCF. So Continuous Delivery Foundation, we took that spec and we used it to create CD events. All right, so going on to our challenge and solution statements. So, Spinnaker has 11 microservices. This is a lot of work to, to manage and build and release. We have a shared library called Quark. And every time you update Quark, well, you have to go and update each of those. Um, well, Quark's one of those 11 repositories. So you'll have to go and update 10 other repositories. Um, Spinnaker, we have different versions. So if you want to update a previous version of Quark, well, you have to update that previous version and make sure you do all the backports and everything appropriately. Um, we have automation around this, but if something goes wrong, that's a lot of work to go and clean up and fix. So with the monorepo, all of that will be done in one pull request. It'll help the Spinnaker contributors understand how the changes impact the overall project. This uh, monorepo concept itself is not just for Spinnaker. Um, many other projects do it. However, last year, Ben uh, Powell from Apple gave a talk at CDCon about how Apple does uh, plugin development using a monorepo for much of the same benefits here. The work on the monorepo is complete. We are facing a couple challenges right now on getting credentials for Gradle and NPM. So um, if anyone knows folks over at Gradle or NPM, uh, please let us know. We are looking to um, prove that we own those accounts and we can start publishing there uh, again. Um, secrets are great, but right now we don't have access to the secrets um, to uh, get the monorepo going. All right, testing. Testing is a big, a big uh, thing for Spinnaker. Uh, 
Spinnaker is a tier zero service. So really, uh, the challenge here is to ensure Spinnaker does not have any breaking changes. Uh, and we include negative performance impact as a breaking change. You can't upgrade Spinnaker if you're running it at scale and there's a performance impact. Um, like Matt was talking about earlier, uh, you know, with OPA and everything, if that gets to be too long, that's going to start to impact their 450K deployments a month. Um, so wh what are we doing here? We're doing an improved testing strategy. Um, we've been improving our integration testing, and then we're also doing load, load and performance testing on, by large organizations. We're currently looking at a, a way to responsibly share this, both the tests as well as the results of the tests, with the community. So we're going to do what we can here. We're also working on a test harness so that every change that makes it within the Spinnaker project is, goes through uh, this test, testing harness. More of an end-to-end -end test versus uh, unit or integration testing. We have an artifact store. Um, so pipeline executions, as we uh, heard in the question and answer section of the last talk, um, they, grew, they can grow very large in size. So pipeline executions are a JSON representation of, every, of the state of the pipeline as every task is ran. This includes representation of artifacts, and these artifacts, as, as you all know, can grow in size. Um, the solution, we're going to cover that later in this talk. A large effort that's been underway for um, uh, quite some time and will continue to, to uh, be a large effort um, is Spinnaker modernization. So the challenge here is, again, Spinnaker is used by very large organizations, right? So JPMC, we just saw Matt uh, Goberly talking about that. So there's a lot of regulations in place. So we need to keep Spinnaker secure and really up to date with modern software development. Um, so in order to do this, we're upgrading Java, Spring Boot, Gradle, Kotlin, Retrofit, and the list goes on. We're not jumping from Java 8 to 21, we're gonna go to Java 17. So we're making these more incremental improvements along LTS releases. Again, Spinnaker is a tier zero service um, at many companies. So we wanna make sure that it's secure up to date and um, we're doing modern development practices. We deploy the code our developers write. Um, it's good for us to also know those same practices as we write um, Spinnaker. Um, let's talk about the account management API. So this is not necessarily an uh, extremely new project that we've added to, uh, sorry, uh, API that we've added to Spinnaker. However, we haven't really uh, announced it too much. So that's what I want to talk about a bit here. So um, the challenge here is uh, adding accounts to deploy to within Spinnaker. The traditional way of doing it is you have a configuration file that you put on CloudDriver and you start the service up and it reads everything in and those are the accounts you can deploy to. If you wanna update those accounts, well, you gotta update the config file and restart CloudDriver. We've made some incremental improvements along the way um, with the dynamic config service, et cetera, but there's a lot of struggles with that. Um, now we have this account management API so you can add accounts to deploy to via an API. Restarts are no longer needed, and this is dramatically simplified and helped um, scaling Spinnaker at many organizations. Uh, improved error reporting as well. So as a developer, um, sometimes the pipeline fails. Uh, for quite a long time, we showed a generic error saying, hey, there was a retrofit error. We don't exactly know what happened. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, to improve this, to improve the error handling and showing relevant messages. Matt earlier showed some OPA messages and that's part of that work. We wanna show those relevant messages back to the, the user so they know why did my deployment pipeline failed. I don't, as a developer, I don't want to have to talk to my Spinnaker team to ask them to get logs on some pod from some service I don't know about so I understand why did this fail when really I have no control over that. I just wanna know actually why did it fail Give me the error right there and I can uh, make, make changes and move on. This issue has been around since 2020 and in the last year we've made significant uh, progress on this effort. Uh, pipeline Builder as well. This is a really cool um, uh, project that's come out uh, recently as from, from Apple as well. Um, so the challenge here is, hey, I want to write a pipeline but I don't know what I can put in the pipeline. You know, there's these stages. I don't know what stages are available. I don't know what information I need to, to add to each stage to make it a valid uh, 
stage within this pipeline. Um, yes, I can use the UI and create a, a pipeline and then copy that JSON, but it's kind of a lot of work and it doesn't help um, folks understand how stages are created. So what's the solution here? We'll build pipelines as code. Developers are developers. Give them Java to write with. They can now write their uh, Spinnaker pipelines using Java. Um, this allows discoverability, IDE, integration, et cetera. Um, there's been many efforts over the years to do pipelines within Spinnaker. So there's been templating, multiple types of templating, um, et cetera. This is a new approach. This is using code to generate pipelines. So this is pretty cool, flexible. Similar to codifying best practices within Spinnaker stages, Pipeline Builder will help codify best practices for building pipelines within the Pipeline Builder. All right, let's talk about community engagement and support. So as you can see, we just went over a ton of projects that are in flight. Um, there's been a lot of collaboration in the last year or two with, within the Spinnaker community. So I will all say we've been doing a really good job at that. Um, it's been very exciting. We do need some help. We, we, we do want more contributors to join us. We have a, a project called Halyard and that helps deployments to Kubernetes, Spinnaker deployments. So you deploy Spinnaker to Kubernetes using Halyard. We've updated this though. Halyard's a pain to work with. Um, we've updated this. We now have Spinnaker customized and that's our new uh, way to deploy Spinnaker to Kubernetes. However, we don't have a good deployment way, a good method of deployment for non-Kubernetes deployments. So that's something that we, we do need help with. So Halyard's still around and it's still getting updated, but we'd like to retire it. We wanna thank it for its job, its duty, and say goodbye. We also would love help with updating documentation. Um, I'm sure most projects have this uh, uh, desire, um, but we're one of those projects as well. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to David to talk about the Artifact Store. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad to follow uh, Matt, who talked a little bit about pipeline execution context. Uh, let me just, re I guess, review that before we go into these details. Uh, and, and what artifacts we're talking about, it's, it's gonna get a little more technical here. If people have questions, stop, you know, stop me and, and ask along the way. Uh, so uh, an artifact in this context is one of the most overloaded words in the CD world, but uh, we're really talking about the output of a bake manifest stage in Spinnaker, which for people who use Helm are like, is baking Helm chart. Uh, so you take a Helm chart, you take some values files, you mush it all together, you get a gigantic blob of Kubernetes YAML out the other end. And Spinnaker is not super smart or elegant about how it handles this gigantic blob of YAML in like the most simple pipeline you can imagine that does a bake and then a deploy, that blob is gonna show up in the execution context like five times or maybe eight times. And you can imagine that like if your Helm chart is big or you know, Matt was talking about, we try to say this in like the nicest way, but sometimes we have customers with pipelines that do strange and unnatural things or something and these pipelines get gigantic, like hundreds of megabytes, gigantic and it turns out that the Orca database is a scaling bottleneck. If you haven't run into it yet, uh, feel good about that. It hurts when you run into it. This is when people get woken up in the middle of the night. So uh, I don't actually know all of, the way, all of the names of the people to give credit to to DC. I will say Apple, and I've worked a lot with Ben Powell on it, uh, but they created this thing that in retrospect seems so smart and so straightforward and so obvious, but it's like kind of a world changer. Instead of taking this blob of Kubernetes YAML and sticking it eight times in your execution context, you replace it with one little reference to S3 and you stick the file in S3. And then, yeah, it's still not great that we store it eight times and we could probably fix that. But instead of being however many, you know, kilobytes or megabytes it is, it's now 15 characters or something of a, of a little reference to S3. And we, uh, you know, have kind of recently rolled this out at Salesforce. I think I may be skipping ahead to a slide here. There's some, yeah, this is, that's the, that's sort of the exciting results, but uh, 
I, I could spend a little time talking about why it's hard to roll it out everywhere because of things that people do with their pipelines. Um, if people have questions about that, uh, maybe it's better to talk about individually. It's going to get super detailed otherwise. But the, but the net result is this, that uh, you know, 90, most of our pipelines got a lot smaller, like 38% you know, of the size that they were before. So like you know, a third or whatever, 40%. It's, even the average size is like half. Like, that's, that's amazing, right? We're all looking for a silver bullet. You rarely get a silver bullet. This is pretty much a silver bullet. And, and uh, we still have a bunch of what I'll say big customers, customers with big pipelines that we haven't been able to enable it for yet. I'll be working on that like next week. Uh, and so I expect to see even more savings. But you know, again, this, this like hits, hits uh, Salesforce right in the, in the sweet spot of like the nastiest scaling problem we have. Like if you can imagine running the biggest database that Amazon will sell and, and like you're maxing it out, and this takes the things you were storing in that database and retrieving from that database and cuts them in half, like that's going to save us a meaningful amount of money and stress and pain. So uh, this is in this is in Spinnaker today. You could use it. Uh, there's actually a, a PR that I need to get merged that's going to go in the next version that helped us collect this data. It turns out that you know logging the size of a pipeline execution is like its own PhD project all by itself. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, the artifact store is there for everybody to use, so I highly recommend it. It is, it is awesome. Uh, and I did want to put in one more plug for something that we've uh, we've done upstream in the last year, which is a way to uh, compress pipeline executions. This is another like, you wake up one night and you know something is on fire and you got paged because you're trying to save something in MySQL and you you've like blown out the limit of the biggest field that MySQL will support because some customer made a very fancy pipeline that they're very proud of. Uh, and you can turn on compression at the database level, except that you could end up maxing out the CPU of your database. And so we ended up adding compression in Java, you know, in, in Orca itself. And, you know, that bought, us, that bought us some runway, a lot of runway. So if you are running into scaling issues like that, uh, you know, flip the flag and turn it on. And if in general you're running into scaling issues, come talk to me because I feel like we've run into all of them at Salesforce. <laughs> anyway, uh, questions? Uh, I, I don't know your name, but it's, hi. I'm Bonnie. 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 Um, I think it depends on the on the cloud provider, Spinnaker is a, oh, sorry, is, the question was, is Spinnaker push or pull based? And so I'm gonna give sort of a vague answer. Spinnaker is a multi-cloud deployment tool that can deploy things to you know, server groups in AWS or Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry or ECS or lots of other things. And I, I don't know the answer for all of them. Uh, so I don't know, I've, I don't even know if I would call Kubernetes push or pull. I guess it's mostly push. Spinnaker is pushing things to the cloud. So in that way, it's, it's push. Uh, you can end up, yeah, it, I think you, I don't know, I'm gonna tie myself in knots, but let's, let's stick with that for now. So it's, I think you're asking a question about like the structure of the code and, and what parts of Spinnaker are deploying to which kinds of cloud providers. Is that right? Right. Is that, is that a reusable component that, like, for example, Project A wants to deploy to ECS, Project B I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the question around a little bit. So, Actually, can I, can I jump in here? I think we're sure. kind of uh, far over time. But if you guys have any questions, um, we'll, be, we'll be right out here. And we're also going to have a TOC meeting in um, 10 minutes. So we do need to head over to that um, and grab some lunch. And we can, we can talk some more. But yeah, let's talk some more there. Let's chat some um, more. Thanks very much. Yeah.